Les Allemands sont rentrés à Paris le 14 juin 1940. The Germans came into Paris on June the 14th, 1940, the day I turned 15. The day before, we already knew they were at the city gates. The day before, my mother sent me down to the cellar with my two cousins because she feared we would be raped. And then the three of us got fed up and went out. We strolled around the Avenue de la République, the Place de la République, and the Faubourg du Temple. We went around the block and we saw these handsome Germans. They were hand-picked men giving out bananas and sweets. Oh, those bananas. I was shocked. And one of my cousins said, I'll have a banana. And I said, you'll have nothing at all. It could be poison. Mummy said it could. Don't touch a thing. Paris, das heißt ersehnte Ziel ist erreicht. Das Herz und die Seele Frankreichs. Sitz großer Teile der französischen Rüstungsindustrie. Der Geburtsort der Demokratie und des Liberalismus ist in deutscher Hand und steht damit unter deutscher Ordnung. Well, I was 15 at the time and to watch those German soldiers marching in the streets, well, they were still at war when they came into the capital. Paris was nearly empty, but edgy, very tense. And all those tall, fair-haired Aryans, well, it was very impressive. We'd never seen anything like it. I'd never seen such a military parade. Soldiers in uniforms the color of verdigris strutted through Paris. So began four years of suffering and humiliation. Marshal Pétain negotiated an armistice. La direction du gouvernement de la France. Je fais à la France le don de ma personne pour atténuer son malheur. C'est le cœur serré que je vous dise aujourd'hui qu'il faut cesser le combat. À l'époque, at the time, everybody was for Pétain. There were plenty of reasons for being Pétainist. Because what could you do? Well, there was nothing to do. Just wait. J'entends le discours de Pétain. So I hear Pétain's speech, which makes me feel secure. It was like a grandfather speaking to his grandchildren. So the grandchildren had nothing to worry about. Granddaddy was watching over them. When he announced the armistice appeal on June the 17th, it was such a shock that I went out to vomit. First came the shock, the shock that we were being handed over to something as abominable as Hitler. The pig, secretly raised in cellars and lavishly cared for, became the symbol of those dark years. Food shortages began in the summer of 1940, and ration cards soon became more precious than identity cards. In Paris, we were really starving. We actually were. We were really hungry, especially us youngsters. You're 16 or 17, you get very hungry, and it was no fun at all. Les chaussures vont faire défaut, rares seront les haricots, on ne trouvera plus... Les porcs étaient élevés soit dans des caves, soit dans des réduits discrets. We used to raise pigs in the cellars or garden sheds. We had to operate at night when no customers were around. And since the ruse of these pig shacks were very low, it wasn't possible to slaughter them in the usual way, only with a big hammer. And you try and slaughter a pig with a hammer in a small shack, without getting the usual squealing associated with the undertaking. It was quite a job. You couldn't go around with a sledgehammer or a knife in your hand. The slaughterhouses were occupied by the German army. 
So I'd get a sergeant from the guardhouse who'd shoot the animal in the head for me. He always got great pleasure from it. And he really enjoyed using his weapon in this uh, unusual way, as well as helping me out. For our supplies, we had ration cards. And look at the substitute materials we had. Instead of a nice leather wallet, we had cardboard ones with different sections for each card, for each commodity. Soap, coal, well, everything. And we had personal cards with categories. Children had an e-card, and adults an A card. Sugar was so precious, it was carried round in little boxes. We were allowed to open twice a week, on Tuesdays and Fridays, two hours a day. And during those two hours, people came to get their coupons. And the substitute product was grape sugar. Well, this grape sugar was an ersatz with which confectioners managed to make fig jelly sweets, which you wouldn't eat nowadays. At the time, they were in great demand. And if you had 50 grape sugar fig sweets, there would nearly be a queue in front of the shop to buy them. A sense of humour was some relief for an empty stomach. A popular souvenir of the time, a key ring the same weight as the daily meat ration. No, about meat. We had cards for meat. Adults were entitled to two and a half ounces of boneless meat a week, three ounces with bones. But we lived off vegetables. <laughs> the first time we saw turnips, we said, they think we're animals. And that's food for animals, <laughs> because that's what we usually fed cows, cattle. Anyway, when we had nothing else, we cooked them. But we used to prefer Jerusalem artichokes. They were better. You could still get carrots without tickets. People used to eat so many carrots that they turned yellow. They had carotin under their skin. Against all the evidence, the government pledged that everyone was getting enough to eat. We used to get eggs from friends of ours who were egg collectors in northern Brittany. And we had to call the police because of the queues. And according to the size of family, we'd let them have six eggs or ten for large families or old age pensioners. We weren't tight fisted. How long were the queues? Oh, dear me. They went from here to, oh, I don't know how many kilometers. They went right round the block. And some of them would ring their relatives in the suburbs to come. And when we ran out of eggs, they would insult us. Oh, that was terrible. I remember once I'd boiled an egg for my little boy. They were eggs from my parents' home, so I was sure they were fresh. So he had his soft-boiled egg. He was three years old at the time. So I said, isn't it nice, dear? You're having a real feast. So he turns to me and says, oh, yes, it's so nice. It must be a pre-war egg. The German forces in Paris were like children in a chocolate factory. The grey mice, as their women were known, went on shopping sprees but the Nazi leaders organized more systematic looting. The French paid for their own occupation and the Germans spread the black market. The other Paris is the Paris of profiteers, the Paris that lives off the occupiers, or at least, thanks to Petanism, that has financial means, that lives comfortably and patronizes the luxury spots, that shows off. There was a large black market at the time, and a lot of people were involved who made fortunes during the occupation. And they weren't investigated later on, because they knew how to manage their affairs. They applied that chapter, I forget which one, out of Hitler's book, the one where he says, I'll corrupt your war. They started to buy things, which is much worse than looting, because they corrupted people's minds. 
In October 1940, the Vichy government introduced laws directed against the Jews, which were even stricter than Germany's own racial laws. The first measures were a census of Jews and the issue of special identification cards. The summons came from the French police. And the fact that it came from French authorities or the French government or the French police was meaningful. Because people thought that Vichy, that was the general opinion even among communists, that Pétain, even as an enemy in charge of evil collaborationist policies, was still France, that he wasn't Nazi Germany. French newsreels delivered German propaganda. Les trois premiers jours, 13 000 personnes ont visité cette remarquable exposition où se trouvent rassemblés les documents, les photographies démontrant le péril juif dans tous les domaines de l'activité nationale. Ces graphiques, ces tableaux, ces statistiques donnent véritablement le vertige. Ils prouvent combien la France, victime de sa générosité et de sa traditionnelle hospitalité, surtout depuis 1936, s'était enjuivée. Tous les postes de commande de la Maison France se trouvaient entre les mains des Juifs. Après avoir jeté dans la guerre un peuple profondément attaché à la paix, ils ont conduit la France vers la plus totale défaite de son histoire. Telle fut l'œuvre destructive des Juifs en France. En 1942, in 42, we were informed by the radio, or maybe by a summons, but I think it was the radio, to go to police stations, town halls and to ration card centres to fetch a Jewish star. And they gave it to us like this, exactly like this. And they said, make four corners. And you sew it on the left side of your garment and you cut it out ça, like this enfin, to put it on ça. like this and that's when I felt a sort of shiver down my spine I was trembling when I realized the enormity of it all without knowing that it led to death and extermination as Hitler gazed at the Eiffel Tower from the Trocadero Esplanade, a few steps away in the basement of the Museum of Mankind, the Parisian underground movement was being formed. Here, Germain Tillon, a young ethnologist, printed pamphlets condemning the occupation and German barbarity. That movement became the resistance. The resistance was just anybody. Ultimately, it depends on opportunity. In reality, when someone, an escaped prisoner, knocks at your door, he knocks at the first door he finds, what do you do? Either you let him in, or you don't let him in. If you don't let him in, you're a filthy bastard. And if you let him in, you're, you're a martyr, whether you like it or not. That's the way it is. The resistance was also a state of mind, a spirit of refusal, a deep-seated rejection of the occupation. For Paul Moulton, a telegraph boy based at the city hall, that rejection started by distributing underground newspapers. French postmen couldn't stand the Germans, that was very clear. So there was a resistance movement among postmen. For instance, the underground press went through the pneumatic tubes, and in the offices there were blokes who would dispatch them to the different services, distribute them. I was a telegraph boy, and we would carry them and put them in letterboxes, etc. There was the guerrilla, liberation, humanity. Well, we carried things like that under our shirts to go through the metro. People were often searched at the Republic station. The searches were very spectacular because the French police would block the entrance. The Gestapo blokes in civilian clothing would pretend to be commuters coming and going. 
so that if anybody sort of shied in front of the police blockade, he'd be caught straight off from behind. There was no escape. Movement in the city was restricted, so the apparent authenticity of forged papers was all important. Guy Saunier, engraver at the Bank of France and quiet man of the resistance, used his professional skills to good effect. I arrived in Paris in 42, at the end of 42, and I started forging. False seals which I carved out of ebonite, and bit by bit I perfected my methods. I would make plaster moulds in which I would pour gelatin, and then the gelatins would be delivered by the contact I had to people I didn't know. I never knew the rest, neither where it came from, nor who it went to. And we had little handbooks which we received, self-defense, and there was a handbook called Civil Defense, written by Mr. A.J. Klein, which explained a lot of things, how to use explosives, how to make Molotov cocktails, how to make the best of gunpowder for hunting rifles, how to derail trains. Let me quote a short passage. Uh, only derail enemy trains. They can be derailed either by explosive when the train goes by or by quickly placing obstacles on the tracks and so on. I was very conscious of the risk. I had an old 92 revolver with me and I studied all the escape routes. And you had to take the risk. That's all. The risk was enormous. For jostling a German warrant officer, an engineer, Jacques Bonsaint-Jean, became the first Parisian to be shot December the 23rd, 1940. For Jewish resistance fighters, anonymity was doubly difficult. What may seem easy, but it wasn't at all at the time, was to change skins. There's the psychological problem of leading a new life, but especially there's the anxiety. During the war, and for a long time afterwards, I had a nightmare. I was somewhere in a room, or a cell, I, I can't recall, and a man comes in. And he calls me by my name, and I answer, I'm here. That was probably a constant anxiety, not to forget where I came from, who I was, except maybe for my birth date, which was unchanged. I remember seeing, side by side, gay Paris posters and posters announcing executions on the same wall. How did you react? Disgust. The Germans wanted things to return to normal and the first places to open after the surrender were the nightclubs and brothels. Collaborationist journalist Lucien Combel saw at first hand the high life of occupied Paris. He started with a What's On in Paris magazine and went on to become editor of a pro-Nazi weekly. I used to go to all the opening nights, since I was on the Comédie Française's guest list. The most memorable premiere was the opening of the Satin Slipper. The cream of the Paris press was there. And the author, Paul Claudel, was sitting in a box. And then the German officers arrived. You could tell they were important by the stripes on their colors. Then came the military governor of Paris, I think, because of the red facing on his uniform. The governor of Paris, I think, because the red facing on his uniform. 
At least he was very important. And his staff followed. He came down the central aisle, of course. And then, I'm still astounded, I saw the German officers turn towards the box where the author was sitting. And clicking their heels the way they did so well, they gave him a salute. And Claudel stood up, bowed and acknowledged their salute very politely. But I wasn't surprised by the presence of German officers. That was usual. They never missed anything. Parisian artistic life had its counterpart in the world of fashion. In September 1940, when cars were replaced by bicycles, elegant Parisian women changed to split skirts and were ogled by German soldiers as they rode past. Soon, Wehrmacht officers were welcome in Parisian high society. There was a small Russian restaurant run by exiles. I forget the name, but I think it belonged to the Duke of Leuchtenberg. It was a rather traditional place, with a pianist. Whenever I came in, in uniform, they knew I liked to sing. He would play, by your side, everything was always so nice. Very popular song at the time in Germany. Very romantic. By your side, everything was always so nice. But because you love another, I must go. Die Münchner Rundfunkspielschar in Paris. Vor der großen Oper singt sie unseren Soldaten ein Heimatlied. Joining in the sing-song with the occupiers was a man who now prefers to remain anonymous. Yes, I remember those songs quite well. They used to sing their German songs, but it wasn't only songs. They loved to dance, to drink, they would invite girls. The atmosphere. We used to sell them English cigarettes, which is funny, because we were able to buy them. And we would sell them to them and make a lot of money. I can tell you I led a marvellous life, I'm sad to say, which is why I don't want to be seen, because I've had my good times. I had everything I wanted. I had everything. With money you could get anything you wanted, you understand? They were very nice. I can't complain about the Germans. I can't complain about them, and on the whole, they were very decent. The boss of these decent chaps, Marshal Goering, came to Paris regularly to organise the looting of France's treasures. He preferred his high life at the Ritz and Maxims. I joined Maxims in December 40. The only customers, so to speak, were German officers, because soldiers weren't admitted and a great many Frenchmen, because the place wasn't reserved for Germans. Whenever Goering would come, he was expected, of course. So there would be men from the Gestapo and the German army, in civilian clothes, and a few wearing uniforms. And certain tables were booked to protect him. But otherwise, it all went very well. Uh, very well. He was an air marshal. He wore all his medals and a pearl grey uniform. I remember quite well. And Paris offered other opportunities. So, my mate Louis, a very nice chap, I'm afraid he's passed away, so he says, I'm getting married, Andy. I need money. You've got your tandem, so we're going to run a taxi bike. Took people around, it was fun, and we'd chat with them, and we'd charge them. 
I remember a woman I'd driven to the Montparnasse station, a fat lady in our little cart. I don't remember whether my mate Louis was there or whether I was alone, I forget. All I remember is when we got to Montparnasse, pow, we're telling the price and she starts shouting and ganging people against us. And there was this bloke, maybe he wore a cap, but he says, Madam, I cannot defend someone who exploits human sweat. <laughs> Ah, I was carefree, and with the Germans going from victory to victory, I didn't imagine it would ever end. I thought to myself, if you like, they were putting a lid on us, and all I wanted then was to have a good time. That's what I did. I was 20. I wanted to live the life. I used to listen to Tino Rossi and the other singers. I went to the cinema. Chased after girls, which was a very interesting occupation for a long time. Well, there you have it. May those who sacrificed themselves so that I could be that way forgive me. But honestly and truly, there's nothing else I can say. The execution lists bear witness to those who sacrificed themselves but there were also those who wanted a quiet life and those who studied the lessons of defeat. Our analysis of defeat was that we were victims of the slackness of the pre-war years. We recall the strikes. As a kid, I remember the countless strikes of 1936. I remember all that. And at the time, we had the feeling it had been harmful to our country because it was a country where people had stopped working. So our feeling at the time was, let's be serious again. Therefore, we were sympathetic to Pétain's ideas. The thoughts of Marshal Pétain on national renewal were widely circulated, even in the cinemas. German newsreels reinforced the idea of a new and vigorous fascist France. Auf die große Stadt wendet ihren Blick zum Lande, zur Erde, die sie ernährt und die bis jetzt so weit von ihrem Pulsschlag lag. Junge Pariser bauen Straßen und Wege und helfen auf dem Lande, die Ernährung ihres Vaterlandes sicherzustellen. Sie geben ein tatkräftiges Beispiel für den neuen Geist, der auch die Jugend der Hauptstadt Frankreichs erfasst hat. And I think that part of the middle class, most of the French middle class, took its revenge on the working class, on the popular front that had imposed certain things. It was revenge. That's what it was, obviously. They used Hitler, the German army, to change things back. For those changes, a tame press was necessary. Although it was often brilliant in style and layout, much of the Paris press was vitriolic about the former standards of French life. Some papers were just tools of Nazi propaganda, but some publishers were granted limited freedom. But not the radio stations. Everyone hummed the taunting tune of the Free French on the BBC. Radio Paris est allemand. He who writes is responsible. I've said it time and again. Words can kill. I can't say more. Words could indeed kill. Informed on or betrayed, the resistance networks were knocked off one by one. German intelligence rapidly infiltrated the Museum of Mankind network. Germain Tillon was betrayed by a priest. She was arrested on August the 13th, 1942. The interrogators, they took me straight to the Rue des Saussées, to a small office. There were eight or 10 men in uniform. They were very restless, nervous. They didn't mind me. I was given a seat and nobody paid attention to me. And then the commanding officer, the one with the most stripes who was sitting at the desk, he took my handbag. He opened my handbag and withdrew a small box of tablets in which there was a small piece of white paper under the tablets. He took the paper, looked at it, moistened it, 
looked at it against the light, and he saw it was just ordinary, and threw it away. He also threw away a list I had. Carrots, 18 francs, radishes, 6 francs, etc. Which actually was the phone number of a British agent. He threw it out. And then they interrogated me several times. And I remember once, he said, we're going to shoot you this afternoon. And I believed it, of course. There was no reason not to believe it. And as in stories, I saw all my life go by. And I shrugged. And then he said, why did you shrug? I'm sorry, sir, I said. I'd forgotten about you. So he said, you, 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 you want to... Till, till you turn black. I remember his words. Till you turn black. In 1942, the Vichy government agreed that French police would round up the Jews. In Paris, some were warned in time, and a few policemen paid for that with their lives. But for the most part, the police followed orders. In three days in July, more than 13,000 Jews were arrested in Paris and herded into a stadium. I went to get my bike at the cycling stadium. I was just back from a race in the country, and there was a cop, two cops, in front of the entrance who wouldn't let me in. You can't go in, they say. Why not, I say. I'm a tenant, because you had to pay a rent to have a cabin there. He says, I'm sorry. I say, who's in charge? Over there, he says. So I go and see a police superintendent and give him my name. Oh, he says, I know you, and so on. Well, I say, I've come to fetch my bike. All right, he says, follow me. But he, he says, you know, there's something going on. Oh, what is it? I didn't know. Well, he says, we put some Jews in there. Oh, and when I stepped into the stadium, which I knew very well, I was aware of this frightful smell. What's going on, I say? So he says, well, there are people who've been herded in. I don't know how many hard to tell, about 10 or 20,000. So instead of going to my cabin and the racer section, I went right down the subway, which went under the track, to go and see. And it was dreadful, really dreadful. Worse than anything, because people talk about the dead, the dead you lay out. But here, they were alive, barely alive. They were in a sorry state, and especially the kids. Bad enough for the grown-ups. You feel sorry. But the kids, it was dreadful, dreadful. 76,000 Jews were deported from France. Only 2,500 came back. For me and for other uneducated people, the Jews weren't quite French. It was sad to round them up, but selfishly, we were bastards, I have to admit, as long as it wasn't us. But this lack of conscience was due to the fact that we didn't know about the atrocities in Germany. I have to say, I never imagined the extermination of the Jews. In spite of the information I had, in spite of what I'd seen in Germany, I didn't imagine it could end in extermination. On April the 24th, 1943, at six in the morning, the doorbell rings. There are two French police inspectors. Am I Juliette Cac? Yes. You are under arrest for hiding your father, your uncle, and a young man who was my cousin. You've been given away. When my father saw them, put the handcuffs on me. He was hiding in the back. He came out. He couldn't stand seeing me in manacles. So they took him away also. And we arrived in Drancy. Oh, it was dirty. It was filthy. And it was the French police who did everything to discourage us by saying, you'll be better off if you're deported. Over there, you'll be all right. Russian rocket artillery crushing von Paulus's 6th German army 
at the turning point of the war. Here, in the ruins of Stalingrad, Hitler's dreams of conquest died. Оставались недавно еще заносчивые генералы, исполнители сумасбродных предначертаний фюрера. Сдался и сам командующий шестой армии генерал фельдмаршал фон Паулюс. We saw an Air Force lieutenant who was there. We knew him well, and he spoke excellent French with no accent. He must have spent a lot of time in France. So we asked him, we felt free to talk to him, well, what do you think of Stalingrad? Ah, he says, we've got it up the... You understand? Well, I say, yes, I've got it. <laughs> Paris, nach dem Überfall britischer Bomber auf die Zivilbevölkerung der Millionenstadt. Über 1000 Tote und 1200 Schwerverletzte sind die Opfer dieses Anschlages. Das sind die Opfer des britischen Luftangriffes. Französische Arbeiter und Arbeiterinnen, deren Väter, Söhne und Brüder den Rückzug der Engländer bei Dünkirchen decken durften. So sieht der Dank der Engländer aus. This German propaganda was rather successful. But for those like Lucien Combelle, the time had come to face facts. In 1943, everything starts to clarify. In other words, I started thinking Hitler's Germany is defeated. And that tomorrow, of course, there are going to be victors. At that thought, that the sole victors are going to be the Anglo-Americans, I wasn't satisfied. I'd have preferred a Soviet victory. Because from ideology to ideology, it's very easy to go from Nazism to Marxism. Easier than you think. At that point, what else can I say? Cuckolds. We were cuckolds, cuckolds who had taken part in a vast enterprise. We were really small cogs, little nothings. For Hitler and his armies, the final battle had begun. A coded message broadcast by the BBC brought joy to Paris. June the 6th, 1944. D-Day. The second front had opened. For Paris, a long-awaited day had arrived. The resistance issued a general mobilization order. Four years of humiliation were avenged by tearing down propaganda posters and trampling the symbols of Vichy. For the first time in history, the Paris police were on the same side of the barricades as the rioters. This film was shot by an underground film unit. 19 Ce peuple sans armes a su trouver des armes. Le feu court et soudain le cœur même de Paris commence à battre et à se battre.
Cet Allemand avait cru il y a quatre ans qu'il avait conquis Paris. La lutte touche à sa fin. Paris achève sa libération. On arrache les écriteaux qui insultaient nos carrefours. Les drapeaux jaillissent. Le blason de Paris refleurit. De toutes les fenêtres, les trois couleurs ont giclé. 45 years later, German Signals Lieutenant Ernst von Breschendorf returns to the Hotel Maurice, headquarters of the military commander of wartime Paris. On the 22nd of August, I was in my office at the Hotel Maurice, second floor, and there was a, a decoding machine. And that's where Hitler's last telegram arrived, from the wolf's lair. It was coded. As I read it, I felt uneasy, very uneasy, because it was the final order to carry out the plan to destroy bridges, factories, government buildings, and the Eiffel Tower, which meant everything of interest and importance in Paris. I didn't want to take part in this shameful plan against civilization. And I thought of my French friends. And I thought of the beauty of Paris. And I also thought about the future of Europe. I thought, if we do it, there will never be peace between the French and the Germans. It would be an unforgettable crime. And for 100, 500 years, reconciliation would be impossible. Réconciliation n'est pas possible. Maintenant, les avant-gardes de la division Leclerc roulent vers Paris. À travers les banlieues, au milieu des hurlements de joie, les soldats casqués vont rejoindre les soldats sans uniforme de la capitale. Quelques tours de chenille et ils sont à l'hôtel de ville. Et là, dans la lueur des torches, ils vivent avec Paris la dernière nuit d'un cauchemar de quatre ans. Alors, au seul moment, nous sommes descendus. So déjà we went down. And Leclerc's troops were already assembled in, in the hôtel lobby. They made us raise our arms and they drove us into the street. Crowd had already gathered and people were very excited. But the soldiers, the resistance men, protected us from the masses. The most distressing memory isn't, of course, the prisoners, because prisoners, you see, they'd waged war. Well, we'd been occupied by the Germans for four years, and we couldn't feel sorry for the prisoners. That's a fact. But the shorn women, that was a distressing sight. Because we saw men, fighters. There was something beautiful about them when they fought. Turn into brutes. Something else was distressing, especially for us social workers. Next to our office, our dormitory office, there was a tribunal that judged collaborators who'd been caught in the neighborhood, or wherever. I was arrested, Place du Trocadero, du Trocadero par les FTP, by the partisans. Sur I'd been betrayed by a woman femme, I was supposed to meet. Cette femme a trahi. Elle a she gave me away. Elle a dit, sera là she said heure, he'll be there at such and such a time. Les sont and là. that's why when I showed up, Et comme ça que je me the cars were there. Au... And that's how I wound up at the FTP headquarters for the 14th district. And if I wasn't massacred, wasn't even beaten, it's because there were these. Well, I'd just come through a crowd that had spat at my face. Well, that was... 
But locked up in a room with a partisan standing in front of the door pointing a machine gun. And all of a sudden, he says, do you need a smoke? I said, no. Here, have a newspaper. But when, a short while later, I asked him to go for a piss, he said, come with me. And he shoved the machine gun in my back, just in case. But, and that's the important thing to me, and I'll never forget, he brought me back into the room, and at one point he asks me, does anyone outside know you've been arrested? I said, no. Do you want me to inform anyone? I looked at him and said, sure, but maybe you won't do it. You'll see, he says. And he did do it. From August the 18th until August the 25th, 1944, when the Germans surrendered the city, Parisians lived through seven unforgettable days of fear, confusion and elation. And almost as soon as General de Gaulle reached the police prefecture, Notre Dame Cathedral, in the cathedral, there were shots. We thought it was a, a rifle salute in honor of General de Gaulle, but in fact, it was snipers. Then it was panic, right there in the center of the cathedral. And finally, General de Gaulle breaks into the Magnificat. It was an unforgettable impression, because there was a sense of fraternity which we'd lost and which we never found again. We really felt that we were French again. No, nous ne dissimulerons pas cette émotion profonde et sacrée. Il y a là des minutes, nous le sentons tous, qui dépassent chacune de nos pauvres vies. Paris, Paris outragé, Paris brisé, Paris martyrisé, mais Paris libéré. The Hotel Leticia, former headquarters of German intelligence, was turned into a reception center for the first survivors from the death camps. We had the impression people looked at us as if we were wild beasts, strange creatures. Well, obviously, we weren't pleasant to look at. Shorn heads, 80 pounds for five foot nine. It wasn't very pretty. On May the 28th, 1945, Julia Kack, one of the very few survivors of those deported in 1943, came home the only member of her family left. I came back along the Avenue de la République. It was a beautiful day. Everyone was sitting outside, in front of their shops. It was a fine day. And when they saw me coming, they all picked up their chairs and went in, because they had it on their conscience. And I went into the house. I went up, and I saw it was empty. The only thing I found was a button from one of my cardigans. It was horrible, and I asked one of my friends to come and live with me here, because otherwise I couldn't have stayed on my own. We met, and later on, well, we said, let's get married. But there's one thing we'll tell ourselves. We're two survivors, like two newborn babies. Whatever happens now is unimportant. We'll get married and we'll see what happens. So, you see, we're both here and everything is fine, very fine, with two children and grandchildren. The two things I recall most when I came back from deportation were first Hitler looking at Paris, the picture of absolute evil, of bestiality, of contempt for mankind. And the other image is when we left Ravensbrück 
an SS officer who glared at us with the hatred of the vanquished.